Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So let's get started with a quick word of prayer just to offer this time to, to the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, thanks for seeing us through this class, uh, now on week 505, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us, and that Lord Jesus, you would show us uh, the wonder of the creation that you spoke into, into being at the beginning of time. Uh, be present with us in this room, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So let's do a really quick review of the last four classes. The main theological point is that God often uses middlemen or intermediaries in his work. Uh, I think a large reason for that may be for the sake of a relationship so that God can involve people, his created order, and angels in his creative and redemptive plans on earth. Um, he doesn't 100% use middlemen, but he seems to use them most of the time. What this means is that because you discover something means that God can never be put out of a job. He's still ultimately responsible for everything, um, the possible exception of our own free will. I won't get into that. But um, in the natural world, you can't put God out of a job if you adopt this mindset. I personally have found that theistic evolution, especially that um, proposed by the BioLogos organization, tends to have a very fulfilling biblical and scientific track record. Um, understanding that uh, scripture was primarily written to establish God as the creator and as a sovereign Lord and our relationship to him, much more so than trying to reveal anything about the natural world. Um, so that's the last four-week review in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to do a quick little PowerPoint thing to bring us all up to speed on the biology, and then we're going to get into some of the evidences for, for evolution, for biological evolution. So this is... Why scientists accept evolution uh, or biomolecular evidence for it? And I don't even have time to go into the fossil evidence for evolution, which we can, it's, it's, it's its own little bit of fascination. So just to set the tone of this, uh, I really like this creation passage from John's account of the gospel. In the beginning was the word, Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of people. Um, and I just wanted to affirm that, yes, uh, even, even with the evolutionary perspective, this is still 100% affirmed. I'm going to do a little case study of one particular biomolecule, which is a protein called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And before I get too much further into this, I have had to do a lot of research in biology in, prepare, in preparing for today's class. I'm a geologist. Uh, a planetary geologist, and I'm not a biologist, but I have been learning a ton about biology lately, and it is blowing my mind afresh. As mind-blowing as supernovas and neutron stars and black holes are, this is kind of equally mind-blowing. So this is really cool. So adenosine triphosphate, it's the food that all of the cells in your body use. Um, and this is the molecule, this is what it would look like if you would draw it in chemistry class. You've got three phosphates here, that's the uh, triphosphate part. And then you've got some uh, nitrogenase bases here uh, with, with, some carbon, with some carbon rings and some hydroxyl stuck on there. This is what it would look like if you could, if you could magically see electron clouds around molecules. This is what it would look like. And it's, and it's what, whenever you eat or drink, your body's making this. And that's where you derive your energy. Uh, here's an animal cell. Here's a plant cell. Uh, these are really egregious cartoons, way oversimplified. And so we're going to see some actual pictures. But adenosine triphosphate is made in animal cells in the mitochondria, which are organelles within the cell. Uh, in plant cells, they're made inside chloroplasts, which has the mineral, or not mineral, uh, uh, that's my geology coming through. It has, uh, has, uh, um, it has uh, chlorophyll in them, which is what gives plants their green color. Uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts are analogous structures between animal and plant cells. Uh, and and they, so they make the ATP, the adenosine triphosphate. This is what they actually look like because I can't show you a diagram without showing you what it actually looks like. That's a paramecium on the left, that's some generic animal cell on the right, and the mitochondria are these organelles right here. Here's the nucleus of the cell, which in eukaryotic cells contains the DNA, the, uh, our genome. Here's a maple leaf, and then if you keep on zooming, you can actually see the individual uh, cells, and the green things in there are the chloroplasts. Those are the things that make the adenosine triphosphate for the plant, and that's what it lives off of. And actually, this kind of, the only formal biology class I've ever had was in 10th grade, and we looked at, at leaves under a microscope, and you could see this. You could see chloroplasts moving around inside cells. I was totally blown away by it, and my teacher was impressed that I was impressed. <laughs> so, um, so it, 
I guess it didn't hook me up for, for me to go into biology, but maybe retroactively it could, I don't know. Um, so if we zoom into a ribosome in an animal cell, which is kind of the analogous thing to a chloroplast in a plant cell, uh, it, you, you zoom into the ribosome, the ribosome has its own kind of a cell membrane. It's almost like a cell within the cell. Ribosomes are the only organelle in your, in your, in, in your cells that have its own DNA. Um, there is a protein called ATP synthase embedded within the membrane of the ribosomes. This is also, I believe, embedded in the membranes of chloroplasts. And ATP synthase takes in protons from floating around inside the cell, or hydrogen ions, and it creates uh, ATP, which then you use. This is, this is literally a machine. This is a, this is a protein. It, it literally has a rotating top to it, and we'll see that in a minute here. So, um, yeah. Um, this is, again, if you can see the electron shells around molecules, this is what uh, ATP synthase would look like. This is a molecule. It's a really huge molecule. And it's a machine that makes ATP. And there's a quick little movie here, really short, uh, that kind of steps you through it. One hydrogen ion enters the ATP synthase. These are hydrogen ions. They enter the top of the ATP synthase, which give enough energy to mechanically rotate the top of this. The upper part of the ATP synthase complex rotates when a new hydrogen ion enters. Once three protons have entered the matrix space, there is enough energy in the ATP synthase complex to synthesize one. In this way, the energy in the hydrogen ion gradient is used to make ATP. Now let's so there, there, an ATP molecule goes off and the cell can use that for energy. This is mind-blowing to me that we have, you talk about proteins and there's this horrible oversimplification used in biology education and it's the phrase that they try to get students to memorize, protein, proteins are the building blocks of cells. I have no idea what that means, it's meaningless <laughs> gibberish. What do you mean by building block? These things are micro-machines. They, they are literally machines inside your cells that are motors, they rotate, they turn, they fold. They do tons of folding to accommodate different biologic processes. These are amazing. Let's move on. This is what ATP synthase looks like from an electron microscope. They're smaller than the wavelength of light, so you wouldn't be able to see it in a light microscope. This bar is five nanometers across for scale, so it's like, these things are like 15 nanometers. So five nanometers, that's 1% the wavelength of green light. <laughs> These are tiny, but they're why you're alive. They're one of the reasons you're alive. Um, so all that was just kind of like show you that cells are way more complex than high school biology textbooks teach, and the way it's often taught in popular level biology books, or the way it's discussed in, in classroom boardrooms where they're talking about should we teach evolution or not. They're, they're ignoring all this really amazing stuff. Um, so I want to focus mostly today on DNA which uh, is basic, it, it really is life's computer. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know where to start. It, it's a, it, each DNA molecule packed into your 50 trillion cells is six feet long, but it's spiraled up so tightly that it fits inside something a few tens of nanometers across, or maybe, uh, it's, just, it's just incredible the amount of packaging that goes on. There's 20,000 genomes, which are coding for different proteins, and by coding for proteins, that's what makes you who you are. So you have a different protein uh, that makes your hair straight, or it makes your hair curly, or makes your eyes a certain color. Uh, these are different genomes that code for slightly different proteins that allow your body to take on different properties. Um, and there are micro-machines called proteins inside your cells that will go along the DNA molecule, temporarily unzip it, read the genetic information, kick out a protein, and then zip your, cell, zip your DNA back together. And also when cells divide, they also unzip, make an identical copy. Each side of this are identical, but they're reversed end to end, and then they stick together. Um, and these are called base pairs inside here. There's only four molecules that do that. Adenine, guanine, uh, I'm gonna forget this. A, T, C, and G. Yeah. Cytosine. Cytosine's one of them. Thymine. Thymine. I think we covered all of them, yeah. Uh, if you unwound DNA, this is what it would look like. These are, um, if you took the two sides of the double helix, uh, untwisted it and actually looked to see what the molecules looked like. They would look like this. And then you have the A, T, C, and G arranged in different combinations uh, that are the rungs of the ladder here. So, all right, that's pretty amazing. Uh, no, and that's it for the PowerPoint. Um, so, hopefully that sets a little bit of the definition so that we can talk about why scientists accept evolution as to describe the development of life on Earth. By the way, this is not 
describing the origin of life on Earth. That is a separate topic. It is still very much an open question with lots of research money available. Some, and NASA's funding some of that to understand how you begin, how you start life, from how you go from geochemistry to biochemistry. That's not known. And neither does evolution attempt to address that. It's a separate topic. So basically, in all of our popular discussions about evolution, we've been lied to. Or at least, we've been giving such an oversimplification of what evolution is that we have a straw man of evolution that's what creationists tend to attack. So they're attacking a straw man, they're not attacking the real theory of evolution. Um, evolution is taught as being random mutation by natural selection. Random mutation, you take that DNA molecule that was just up there, and you just randomly move stuff around. Once in a while, moving those bits around will be beneficial, and things that are beneficial will have a more likely chance of surviving. That's the natural selection bit. So there's two components here, random mutation, that would be moving genomes around. Oh, you know what? There's something I really wanted to emphasize on that. The projector's off, so I'll just turn my computer around. But um, um, so I don't know if this is visible at all or not. But a genome is a section of the DNA molecule that codes for one protein. So your DNA is six feet long, but there's 20,000 genomes within there, and th those are just start and stop. They're just sections of that of that DNA. When your cells uh, reproduce the DNA gets coiled up into what are called chromosomes. So most of the time, if your cell's not dividing, you don't have, your cells don't have chromosomes because a chromosome is a specially coiled segment of DNA that then allows for its uh, duplication for a new cell to be born, whether it's a liver cell, a heart cell, et cetera. And all the cells in your body have the exact same uh, DNA in them, but there's different segments of that that tell it to be a heart cell or a liver cell. There's certain sections, certain genomes that are activated or deactivated, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So what's basically incorrect in this definition is random. That's basically wrong as to how you get genetic modifications within DNA. Mutation is kind of correct, but it emphasizes the wrong aspect of it. Natural selection is correct, but natural selection doesn't explain where stuff comes from. Natural selection only explains what survives. The reason the only old buildings that are still around are good looking is because all the ugly ones were torn down. <laughs> So, in the same way, uh, if you have mutations in, a, in an organism that don't work, it's going to die, leaving only the, the, the things that are successful at living. So that's the natural selection bit. So here's how evolution really works. And I'm basically indebted to this book right here. This is Evolution 2.0 by Perry Marshall. He's actually a computer scientist and a mathematician, and specializing in information theory. And he... Um, and he, it's a well-documented, well-referenced book. I've done a lot of fact-checking in here, and he's right from the uh, peer-reviewed articles that I've followed up with on here. But he does a really great job um, of, of breaking down how evolution actually works, not how it's paraphrased to popular audiences. Um, and by the way, this is the type of evolution that practicing biologists deal with in their laboratories and in their grant proposals every day. Um, unfortunately, it's not taught in high school or in, as far as I can tell, uh, like freshman biology classes in college, and I don't know why, because it's fascinating, and I think it clears up a lot of misconceptions right off the bat. So one aspect of how mutation, of, of, well, so you could sum up evolution as adaptive mutation, or perhaps even adaptive self-engineering, plus natural selection, equals evolution. So let's break down this adaptive mutation part. The first bit of adaptive mutation is a process called transposition. Transposition is where you, you've got your six-foot-long DNA molecule with 20,000 genomes or so in it, um, and, you, uh, and the cell, on its own, can rearrange segments of its own DNA. It would be like a computer program reprogramming itself while it's running and acquiring new capabilities. And this is, we see this in the laboratory. In fact, Barbara McClintock got the Nobel Prize in 1983 for biology when she did, it, it, as a result of her discovering of this process of transposition. She did decades worth of experiments on Indian corn. You know, it's got lots of different, it's hard kernels, lots of different colors. She could damage bits of DNA and then basically see how the cells would rearrange their own DNA to survive. And it would result in different patterns of colors in the kernels that she could track and correlate with genetic changes. So this is real. This is demonstrated in the lab. So when people say there's no evidence in the lab for evolution, it's just patently false. Um, fortunately, uh, for those of us who are not geneticists, you can analogize a lot of this stuff just by using English grammar. And so we can imagine a situation where we have uh, a genome, A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, G, H. Uh, transposition says, all right, I'm just going to 
Maybe there's a toxin in my, in my, in my environment, so I'm just going to take this section of, of code, duplicate it, and paste it right here. So now the genome says ABC one two three DEF one two three GH. All I did was all I did was copy and paste it and stick it in there. Now sometimes this is not going to be successful. It's going to result in uh, an erroneous genome, and the cell will die. But if it's successful uh, and it enhances the cell's ability to survive, that's where natural selection kicks in, and it's going to promote this to its progeny. Um, so Question? That, yes. Is is its decision to cut and paste the one two three random? Kind of it, yes, um, but it follows. It's ran, It could be random, but it also follows rules. Um, rules of chemistry that dictate where it can go. Okay. So it, it's not a case of, hmm, let's try this. As far as I can tell. Also, I'm not sure this is completely understand how the cell decides to edit its own genome. Mm. That's still an open area of research. By the way, this is still an open area of research. There's still a lot to be learned. So I think it's a bit mysterious how it decides to do this, but it happens, and we can watch it happen. Um, there's another bit of evolution of adaptive <coughs> mutation called horizontal gene transfer. And it's between, it could be between two completely different species. Uh, and I've drawn bacterium A and bacterium B. Let's say that they're different species of bacteria. But this could happen between like more complex cells and a multicellular organism like you, or a plant, or an animal, or a fungus. And in the case of, but in the case of bacteria, uh, let's say it's making you sick. Uh, one of these bacteria has resistance to, anti to antibiotics, and this one doesn't. If these two cells get close enough to each other, this guy will send off a pilus, which is a little tube connecting the two cells. This bacteria says, aha, you've got some piece of genetic code that makes you resistant to antibiotics. And it will literally, and so this is a superbug, that's what the super cell is for. So it's resistant to, anti to antibiotics. And uh, this bit, and that bit of code gets transferred to this guy's genome, and he edits and splices it right within his own genome on the fly as his program is running, and now he's resistant to bacteria as well. So he has this newfound superpower ability here to resist the um, antibiotics. That's scary. Yeah. Does it get a cape as well? <laughs> <laughs> is this what GMOs are about? I mean, like genetically modified. I, I I don't think so. I think that is more to increase crop yield so that mm -hmm. you're you just have more food per plant, basically. I think. But to resi more resistant to certain diseases. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, that may be. I'm no expert on that. I don't know. Oh, okay. um, this would be the grammatical equivalent of one species having the genome ABC. Another species having the genome UVXWYZ, and then ABC getting spliced into this genome UVABCXYXWYZ. You have just evolved on the fly instantaneously the capability of doing something you didn't have the capability to do before. This is demonstrated in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, it happens. Um, what this means is you, you, you may have seen before, whether you have accepted it or not, the evolutionary tree of life where, you know. Uh, you know, we've got all these branching species that evolved from each other, etc. What this means, this is, this is transferring genetic code, not between offspring, but just between adjacent cells. What this means is that we've got this, like, incestuous crossbreeding between species, which greatly complicates the tree of life into some ugly bush. <laughs> so, you know, this is pretty amazing to me that, that this happens. Um, this could happen, uh, for instance, uh, supposedly uh, from a, a bacterium or some cell inside your body that may be in your intestine that communicates with one of your your own intestinal cells and can you can swap genetic code so this this doesn't have to happen between simple single cell organi organisms but uh, but it can not really a mechanism but by one of the ways that uh, I don't know life happens again I'm not a biologist I'm oversimplifying things so forgive me but cells can communicate to each other uh, by molecules. They, there's specific types of molecules that a cell will give off that then can be uptaken by other cells in your body. This is how you can get a bacterial infection. One bacterium is not on its own, can't do anything to you by itself. It could be the ugliest, deadliest bacteria around, but if there's only one of it in you, it's going to get squashed. Your body, it will, it will divide and divide and divide in your body to the point it, oh, and it'll divide throughout your body. You won't get sick until these cells communicate with each other via molecules through your lymphatic and circulatory systems. 
And when enough of these communication molecules accumulate, and all the cells receive these, in, a, in an instant, all cells all at the same time will attack you, and you'll get sick. Um, this is also how um, bioluminescent algae will fluoresce in certain places around the world, like Australia. You can, there are waves splashing, and you'll see bacteria light up. The way they all light up at once is because they're communicating via these molecules that are floating in the ocean that they then uptake. And when it reaches a critical mass, they all decide to flash at once. So this is how bioluminescent algae decide to flash all at once. This is how you get sick uh, with a bacterial infection only after enough time has gone by, such that there are so many bacteria in your body that they actually can do something bad to you. Um, this can also result in self-directed genome editing. The, the cell's like, I, I'm going to move the, and it, I think it gets back to the transposition, I'm going to move these sections of code around. Another aspect of evolution is epigenetics. Um, a lot of this stuff has only been really been fleshed out in the last few decades, but epigenetics is the process, I should look at my notes. Um, there, there are acquired traits that you can pass on to your project, even though it's not necessarily part of your code. Or it's part of your code, but you've chosen, but your body has expressed codes differently. An example is getting calluses on your hands if you're like a guitar player or something. You have caused your body to express certain genomes to make calluses on your fingers, and you can pass that on to your progeny. One example is a, the, uh, there was a famine in uh, Denmark, I think, in, the 19, in 1944, and people who were starved and were used to not having enough nutrients um, had certain epigenetic changes to allow their bodies to respond to a starvation diet. They then passed on those same epigenetic changes to their progeny, and those descendants still, they tend to be smaller in stature, they tend to have health problems related to um, a starvation diet, even if they're perfectly well nourished now, but they have genetic modifications through epigenetics, just through their parents acquiring a trait uh, from a starvation diet, or reprogramming certain aspects of their cells uh, to have certain capabilities. A, a grammatical example of this would be um, this right here, which I stole directly from the book. Flight 6429 was delayed from Chicago to Winnipeg so it will not be departing before 6.45 p.m. Now I've chosen to not express certain of these genomes or certain of these words, and I can make it say something completely different. Flight 29 to Winnipeg will depart before six. It still makes grammatical sense. This fo so this follows rules. You can't just cross off random words and make it say gibberish. It still has to make sense. Uh, in the same way your genome still has to follow certain rules, I suppose dictated by chemistry, which in turn is dictated by physics and the quantum mechanics between the molecules. Um, but you can, you, can, you can change how the, the, your genomes are expressed. Another mechanism of evolution is symbiogenesis, which blows my mind. Uh, this is result from cells merging together to form a new species. Um, an example is if you start with an algae cell, or a protozoan, uh, sorry, no, protozoan, some type of simple cell. Cyanobacteria, which we think are the first life to have emerged on Earth. They're very simple cell, prokaryotic cells. Um, these guys can literally be absorbed, eaten by these cells, and start a symbi symbi symbiotic, uh, symbiotic, thank you, say it again? Symbiotic. Thank you, symbiotic relationship <laughs> with this host cell. To the point where we have a plant cell. This is where chloroplasts come from. Chloroplast used to be its own species of cell that was incorporated to a, another type of cell, and now you have plant cells. It's to the point where chloroplasts can't live on their own outside of the cell. And this is also why chloroplasts, or in animal cells, mitochondria, also have their own DNA. Because they were once their own individual cells, they got incorporated into other cells, which greatly enhance the capabilities of both. These make food for the overall cell, and the overall cell provides uh, support and, and, and protection for the chloroplast, or for the mitochondria in animal cells. So you can even trace this backwards. Um, you can start with um, eubacteria plus archaeobacteria will give you an archaeoprotist, and arche archaeoprotist plus a paracoccus will give you a protozoan. You take a protozoan, you ingest a cyanobacteria, it gives you algae. You take algae plus yeast and you get a plant. This, can, this, this is like instantaneous evolution. When it happens, it happens fast, um, often only after one generation. Now, this is in the case of a successful merger. A lot of mergers will not be successful, and so those things die off. 
for the ones that are successful will be selected naturally, that's the term natural selection, to continue on. Genome duplication from hybridization. Um, you know, we're all familiar with mules, horse and a dog, you get a sterile mule. It's not going to reproduce, but it's, an, it's its own animal. Once in a while, cross-species hybrids actually are fertile. Not very often, but they can be. When that happens, you have a new species. This is thought to have been the case uh, between two species of sea squirts that normally could not successfully mate with each other, although perhaps due to environmental change or some other pressure, you know, sea squirt A couldn't find a, another of sea squirt A to mate with, so it's like, well, I'll mate with the closest thing, here's sea squirt B. Sea squirt A and B get together, probably not, nothing gonna happen. Once in a while, maybe something will happen. And what this actually does is it doubles the genetic information available. If you have C squared A with the genome A, B, C, D, E, F, C squared B has A, B, C, D, G, H, you've, you can, sometimes you can successfully combine their genomes to give you A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, G, H. Now, you won't necessarily make a completely different looking species right away, but you'll at least have the genetic basis for that, such that these other processes can express new either cell structures or new uh, structures in the, in the, if it's a multicellular organism, um, if you're, if you're, if you are originally a land animal, like some kind of large mammal, you start getting in the water, your legs will eventually evolve into fins. And this is the case with whales and dolphins. They were once land mammals and they have evolved the capability to swim in the ocean. Um, these different processes, which are not predictable, but that's not to say that they're necessarily random. They're not predictable and they're incredibly complex, uh, can indeed create lots of new information or, or the same amount of information expressed different ways and combined in different ways that follow rules, uh, just like we have, we're have, we following grammatical rules here, um, to create new life, new forms of life. Wow, I'm going through this a lot faster than I anticipated, which is fine. Um, so, you know, there's also lots of fossil evidence that I didn't put in here. But, so the takeaway from the genetic bit is that when evolution happens, it's fast. Um, it can be, it's, um, it's organized, it follows rules analogous to linguistic grammar. It can be adaptive to environmental changes. You can take a petri dish of bacteria, feed it everything at once, they're happy, no mutations will happen. In fact, there's lots of mechanisms within the cell to prevent and fix mutations. Mutations are generally bad. Now, if you, start, if you starve that culture of bacteria, they're gonna evolve a new capability to survive. Most of them will die off, but a few, through these different processes, can actually evolve the capability to deal with either an environmental toxin or not enough food, and they'll evolve a new capability very quickly. So evolution isn't continuously and slow. It's nothing and then punctuated, something happens. Nothing and then punctuated, something happens. Um, this isn't controversial. This is, this is, as it's practiced, this is what the peer-reviewed literature talks about. Unfortunately, somehow it doesn't trickle down to the classroom. I have found. So, it's a, so that, all that to say it's adaptive to environmental change. Also, there tends to be a perception that natural selection creates new information. It doesn't. All it does is it takes what's successful and allows it to live, while it allows unsuccessful uh, changes to die off. Um, well, Dee Dee, you wanted to get through everything before the sermon. So... I did. I <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but now I have about 500 questions. I Go. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, oh no, you got time still. So. You got at think? least five minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it seems to me there needs to be a very uh, creative mind behind all that to kind of organize it and direct it. Yes, <laughs> but if we're watching this process happen, we're never going to see the laws of science, chemistry, and physics violated. That's not to say that God isn't behind it, but Psalm 77, God's footsteps are hidden. How God, I, so I agree that yes, it takes a creative mind to let this happen, but at the same time, God is hiding his exact interface between the natural world and what he intends to have happen. Yes. And we can still come up with naturalistic explanations for why this happens, but it, it doesn't put God out of a job. Right, and it doesn't prove his presence. That's correct. But it is kind of 
bizarre to think that all these little bitty itty things can do all this stuff just on their own without something directing it. Well, so we see these experiments happen in the lab. Um, people have artificially created lichen from symbiogenesis in the lab between fungus and bacteria. Mm -hmm. So this stuff happens without it appearing to be directed. Although I think, so the whole directed bit, that's not a scientific thing. I think philosophically and theologically we can go there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's a set of observations or experiments you can do to, to prove or falsify that. No, I agree with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we have to recognize the limits of theology and philosophy and the limits of science. Correct. Science doesn't tell us about meaning, morality, and destiny, and purpose, teleology, but it also doesn't tell us about colliding neutron stars and gravitational waves. There's a, uh, a study that was done in World War II about a group of, of little finches mm -hmm. that learned to uh, peck around uh, the cardboard tops of milk bottles to get in to get the cream. And in later years, they replaced the cardboard tops with metal tops. But generations of finches continued to try to peck through the metal tops, proving that that ability to, to peck through had been transferred to them. That's probably an epigenetic change where the, the genome stays the same, but you, you can cross off or uncross off certain aspects of the genome. Mm -hmm. The parents learned to peck that way. Right. They express already present genes, they just express them differently, or they either got rid of the cross off or they crossed something off. Um, and then they passed on that, that learned trait. That seems to be that's how I would explain that as a yeah, biologist. Yeah, well, I wondered which one of those. That sounds like epigenetic, epigenetics to me. Yeah. Um, Kirby, you can yes. talk about the origin of life theories as a geologist. Yeah, so I've got a friend at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, who works on this. Uh, she just gave a talk last week, it, and she, so she studies origins of life. And it's thought that somehow you started, you arrived with ribonucleic acid, RNA, which is like a single strand version of DNA. It's a self-replicating molecule that then somehow got protected by a protocellular membrane. This is called the RNA world hypothesis. What she is trying to do in the lab is uh, to see if, and the reason I showed this thing about uh, ATP synthase is she's trying to see if you can geochemically make a very simple version of ATP synthase in the lab by simulating an early Earth ocean. So she, uh, she has um, beakers that has the chemistry, as far as we can tell, of early Earth's oceans. She has a hydrothermal source, like where um, you, you would have like magma underneath uh, like a, an Atlantic Ocean spreading center. You, you're circulating hot water through there. It's dissolving minerals from the rock, and then as it gets into the water, it re-precipitates them, and it forms these huge chimneys of, of material. Um, and there's actually a lot of electrochemistry going on. I'm speaking way outside my league. But there's lots of electron and proton gradients between there's the same kind of chemistry that happens in batteries. There's a huge energy source there. And she's getting to the point where she thinks she could um, um, make a structure that is analogous to ATP synthase. And so we're starting to get at how life could have started. Um, probably around hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor between uh, hot fluids and a lot of minerals. Um, that's all I'm qualified to say about that. Probably more. <laughs> yeah. So, however it starts, various primordial soup, whatever you want to call it, according to evolution, that turns into dogs, cats, goat, trees, human beings. It's just, it's just, we, it's just sand out that much. Yeah. Okay. Have they ever found anything alive that doesn't show the common bond with everything else? No, not at all. Okay. In fact, when I mean, we look at the there's genomes, no freak thing out there that's just like, whoa, that, that's not no. I've never heard of that. If that, that would make a cover of Nature or Science, like just like that. If they ever <laughs> found that, that would be heralded as an independent origin of life on Earth. If they ever found that. Right. Um, 
what's, what's fascinating, and, and if human evolution is too much for you to bite off, at least consider the evolution for all other life on Earth. Um, I personally do accept human evolution, but if that's too much, then at least consider the evidences for evolution for all other life on Earth. Um, um, what's fascinating is that even in humans, we have uh, deactivated sections of DNA, deactivated genomes, that are the same deactivated genomes in other primates, like chimps, orangutans, and bonobos. Um, we have, uh, in our, two of our chromosomes show evidence of fusion from two primate genomes. That humans, I think, have 23 genomes, other primates all have 24. So along the way, either we got rid of a, a chromosome in our genome, or two existing chromosomes fused together, and there's all the evidence in the world for them fusing together. Uh, from the structure of those. It's like taking two bits, I don't know if you were here two classes ago when I wasn't here, but I took a video, there's a video that's been explaining that on how you, it's like taking two bits of shoelaces with the plastic bits and sticking them together. You see that we see two telomeres stuck together in the middle of our, one of our chromosomes. Consistent with fusion, with chromosomal fusion. Um, but, but whether it's us, our cat, or the oak tree, they're all the same stuff in theory is throughout all of us. Yes. It's the same four genetic letters, A, T, C, and G, which are abbreviations for long chemical names, uh, just expressed differently in a different length and in different combinations. Yeah. I didn't even get into the fossil evidence, which itself is amazing. If you just, I mentioned dolphins and whales. Um, if you look at a dolphin or whale skeleton, they've got a pelvis. It's this tiny little thing stuck back behind their tail. It, it's not connected to the rest of their skeleton. It is literally just floating in the midst of the rest of the muscle and fat and connective tissue. It does nothing. You could surgically remove it, and the animal would be totally fine. Wouldn't notice that it was gone. If God created whales from scratch as a special creation unto itself, why would you put a useless vestigial pelvis floating in the midst of that? It does nothing. But it's entirely consistent with a land animal starting to venture into the water, uh, and through various uh, environmental changes, uh, giving rise to like epigenetics and horizontal gene transfer. Uh, over time, uh, feet giving way to flippers. Um, and I'm going out on a limb, but it seems to me like seals are some kind of transitional species. Because if you look at their flipper fins, they look like feet. Like if they look like a cross between a flipper and a foot. It could be a transitional species, might be evolving into something right now, I don't know. Um, so we see this in the fossil record. As geologists and paleontologists dig through the stratigraphic column, we see different fossils that lived at different times in Earth's history. And they don't occur in any other layer. For example, between 500 and about 350 million years ago, there are these cute little crabs called trilobites, crossed between a, like a crab and a cockroach. And they lived on the ocean floor. They're really cute. I want one for a pet, but they've been dead for a long time. And they, they appear down there, where all the sediment has accumulated, but they don't appear higher up in the stratigraphic column. Similarly, we only see, for example, dinosaur fossils uh, in, in strata that correspond to the Mesozoic. The, um, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and, uh, and uh, Jurassic, Triassic, and Cretaceous. Um, we don't see those anywhere else. We see <laughs> animal fossils starting in the late Mesozoic and continuing up to the present. But we don't see any of those earlier life forms mixed up in the upper life forms. This is inconsistent with a lot of young Earth creationism that says that um, everything lived all at once, basically. But, it, but isn't that the missing link in the fossil record? that? Shouldn't those all somehow find evidence of that blending through every single layer? We find a bit of that. We do find a bit of transitional life forms, like Archaeopteryx. Cross, it looks like a cross between a dinosaur and a bird. It has feathers, it has wings. It's not clear if it flew or not. So we see some transitional species, or fossils. Another thing to keep in mind is that fossilization is extremely rare. The overwhelming majority of organisms that have lived and died have not been fossilized. They've totally decomposed. So to even get a fossil record is very rare. And so we're, so we're probably missing a lot of transitional links. But we also do see transitional life forms as well. Also, what we've learned through evolution is that evolution can happen very punctu in a very punctuated way. You can go from two species through hybridization, genome duplication from hy hybridization, um, you, 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 can, you can double the amount of genetic code you're working with. And then if this happens again, you've quadrupled the original genetic code. And so evolution can also happen very fast. You can evolve new um, uh, body parts very quickly because you've got the information for it that you didn't used to have. Um, this is thought that this is how uh, first uh, invertebrate animals, hagfish, not hagfish, uh, sea squirts, um, 
produce enough genetic information to create animals with uh, a spine, vertebrates, and then through this process again, you, you had the information to create the first jawed fish, uh, or fish to actually evolve a boned jaw. Um, or is that going with that? Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, and that happened over the course of billion years? No, years that ago. happened very quickly. Very quickly. That quickly. happened within a few generations. Within so, one to a few hundred years, or a few thousand years. Really? Yeah, it can happen very fast. That's the whole point of this, is that when, when evolution occurs, and it's not occurring all the time, but when it occurs, it can happen very fast. It takes a long time to get it all together to make it happen. Though. Sure. You could go a few millions of years without any significant changes, but then if you have like a hurricane when you don't normally have hurricanes in a species that cuts off like a waterway, you've got flooding or a drought, you can all of a sudden uh, spur on a lot of change. The cells go, cells start freaking out and start editing their genomes because they need to survive. Most of them will die off, but some of them will survive, and the ones that do are more successful at reproducing. And so this is how you can go for long stretches of time, nothing, and then boom, lots of new species with new capabilities that weren't there before. Hmm. And that's not taught, and I don't know why it's not, because it's I find it compelling. Yeah. What I find really fascinating is that more doesn't go wrong. I mean, this is <laughs> incredibly complex, and that um, the rules, you know, that there are rules, and that um, uh, that there's no chaos here. I mean, it's it's so orderly. Well, on one hand, I'll agree with you. On the other hand, a lot of animals, a lot of species had to die through unsuccessful yeah. mutations. Right. In fact, most mutations are not. Well, even successful. that's part of the rule, though, isn't it? Yeah, kind In of. In a sense guess. that you know it, it <coughs> reaches its limits of of adaptation or whatever, you right. know, of, of being able to survive. But um, or, or like our genies, though. I mean, like it can it can switch around and correct itself. Right. Yeah. Um, so what I should have mentioned at the beginning was that Theodius, Dob uh, Theodius Dobzhansky, which was an American, Ukrainian American geneticist, uh, did some fruit fly experiments where he, he wanted to ex try to accelerate the rate of evolution in fruit flies by exposing them to radioactive radiation. The idea was to create random mutations in their genome once in a while, getting a successful mutation that would enhance a fruit fly's chance of surviving, and basically evolve new species. It was a complete failure. After decades of experiments, all of the random mutations, truly random mutations from either uh, transcription errors or more likely in this case from radiation damage, resulted in uh, the death of the fruit fly, um, literally legs growing out of eyes that hindered its abilities to survive, and so that's like, that's natural selection killing off something that doesn't work. The only thing that could be considered an evolutionary success was certain populations of fruit flies that have been exposed to moderate levels of radiation were more radiation tolerant. They could more easily correct the, uh, the mutations in their genome than others. That's the only slightly positive thing that came out from that. And so this totally flew in the face of the, of the prevailing wisdom in the mid 20th century that said that mutations were truly random, literally just taking molecules and swapping them in and out. It doesn't happen that way. It's much more orderly and much more almost purpose driven, but it, it fulfills a purpose. Or it, 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 it follows rules of chemistry as opposed to truly being just Good. Yeah. I got a question. Yes. Um, can we circle back to epigenetics? Sure. Um, so, with the finches that we were talking about a couple minutes ago, obviously the finches have little baby finches, and the baby finches watch their parents peck in at the top of this milk yeah. carpet. So they're they're seeing a technique, and could it be possible? Like, I guess what I'm curious about is like, what's the difference between genetic the genetic code in DNA being modified uh -huh. versus just seeing something that's happening and learning, and I guess learning by example. Well, I guess those are two different things. I, okay. I don't know if baby finches watch mommy and daddy do that. Sure. Another example was the, um, and I have it in my notes somewhere, it was the 1944 famine in, I think, Denmark. Oh, Dutch famine of 1944. Yeah. Right. You're not learning to be starving. Sure. Starving is not a learned trait. Right. But if you are starving uh, and your body, reacts to that stress by certainly by uh, expressing or unexpressing certain genomes, not changing the code, just expressing what's already there differently, you can pass on those epigenetic changes to your progeny, who then think that they're always starving and have all the associated health risks from that. 
but you bring up the nature and nurture thing. It's like, yeah. are the finches watching other finches doing this? And so they exactly. say, hey, I'll try this because there must be something to it. Right, and that's kind of the line that I'm trying to figure out. Okay, where, does it be, where is it nature and where is it nurture? Because like, okay, if it, if it was, if I could modify nature through nurture, then I would like, be lifting weights way more, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I don't know if it works that way, you know. Like if, if so, do you see? Do you know what yeah, I'm I see what you're about? saying. Okay. I don't. I can't speak to that. Okay, I'm just curious. Maybe in Dee Dee's experiment that she mentioned, maybe they took away the baby birds and they, you know, raised them independently of mommy and dad. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, you have to look at that. Right. Of course, food-seeking behavior, animals will try anything all the time. I think this gets back to why salmon go back to the same string they're responding. Um, how do they know how to do that? Mm -hmm. If they've never like. Or migration. Or migration. Right. You know, if you take a cat, could you be take a cat goose from the East Coast flyway mm -hmm. and transfer it to the West Coast, which has been done, they die because they they fly looking at the shore and they and they have instinctive behavior that that in one season they're going to keep the shoreline to their right oh, wow. as they migrate, and in the yeah. other season they're going to keep it to the left. So if you put them on the other shore, they'll fly out the ocean and drown. Wow. wow. That's been done. <laughs> Poor person. Yeah. There's, right now, in the London Underground subway system, there's a new species of mosquito calling, as we speak. Um, That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're mosquitoes that only live underground, in the dark. Uh, you know, these have only been around since the, like, the late 1800s when they dug the London Underground. And they're getting to the point now where those mosquitoes, and they were just above ground mosquitoes that went down underground. Like I would do if I was a mosquito, there's a new subway system, I'd go down there. And um, those below ground mosquitoes, when you bring them above ground, have problems reproducing with those above ground people, mosquitoes. Um, they're getting to the point where they cannot have fertile offspring with the original generation, or the, with the original population of mosquitoes. We're seeing a creation of a new mosquito species right now. Um, we also see examples of endemic species, species that only exist in one part on Earth. Like the, there's like some flower that only grows on like Haleakala in Hawaii or something. It's like the silver sword, I think. I think. Um, there's examples all over the globe, but this is exactly what you would expect if certain very specific environmental changes uh, lead to certain genetic changes that create for the new species. But you need bio, you need physical isolation. That helps. Yes. For for this punctuated evolution, so that they can't backbreed to the wild. Right. Form. This gets into plate tectonics. Yeah. You know, the tech, you know, continents moving apart from each other, physically isolating populations that used to be next to each other, and they can evolve independently to the point where eventually they can no longer reproduce with each other. That's pretty amazing to me. Like weather, climate change, continental uh, or, or genetic drift, continental change, um, all these geological or an asteroid hits, all of a sudden planetary science comes into the mix. Uh, you can you can isolate certain biologic populations, environmental change leading to new uh, changes. Now that that could be considered random in the whole random mutation bit, but just saying that it's random mutation way oversimplifies it and gives you the wrong impression. It's it's oversimplified to the point of giving you the wrong impression about how how it actually works. So on the transposition, when that happens, is that because of an effect from the outside, or is it just that's what we do? Well, that'd be an example of if, like, um, a if you were exposed to radiation and some of your cells got damaged. If a cell is damaged but not super damaged, it can repair its own DNA. Um, that, that's what Barbara McClintock discovered in her um, Indian corn experiments. She would literally, she would, on purpose, damage some of the DNA. The corn would fix itself by copying and pasting bits of its own genome. So it's, it's responding to some outside yeah. influence. It's as if the cell's smart and it's trying to preser preserve itself. Yeah, it's incredible that, that that transposition happens. Even transposition by itself just completely blows my mind. And like, what about people in the last? I don't know, but we're all been pretty much the same for the last 10, 20,000 years or something. Yeah. How come we haven't had somebody that? Well, you know, better they're, hearing, better sight. That that does happen. Um, we have epigenetic changes that we pass on to our children, learn behavior. It's why, like, if I have seen studies where. For example, mothers under lots of stress and duress have children who tend to be more stressed out and all the, like the hypertension and all the blood pressure and whatever issues associated with that, those are epigenetic changes. Um, what do I want to say? Um, 
through genome duplication from hybridization. All humans from non-African descent actually have about 6% Neanderthal genome in the or Neanderthal DNA in their genome. People of African descent have much less uh, Neanderthal DNA in their genome. So in, in, our, in our past, there were some going around with Neanderthals that went on to the point where it's, it's in our genome. We can trace it. It's there. Um, and so a few ethnicities, um, even though we're all the same species, um, have shown small genetic changes like this. Um, so, uh, adaptations to sunlight are, are, can control skin pigmentation. People who, uh, you know, populations that grow up in really sunny areas, more close to the equator, will have darker skin. That's more melanin that protects them from ultraviolet light. People of European descent, growing up at, at, at more poleward latitudes, don't need as much melanin in their skin, and so they never literally evolved uh, that capability. Now, that may not be um, new genetic information. That may be an epigenetic change where the melanin-producing genome is just activated more in people who grew up close to the equator. What about um, looking back over time and seeing how much, just for example, how much taller we are than people 150, mm -hmm. 100 years ago? Now, you always say that's because of better nutrition, clean water, those sorts of things, right? I mean, you're, don't you advocate for the fact that that's typically brought about by living in a better environment? But and people say that that's childhood disease. Yeah. That, but, that but I'm wondering, you know, that's... Hard to, you know, it's hard to say why. Yeah. It's just it's yeah. a fact. Yeah, I, I can't speak to that, but I, I know but people But I mean, are, clearly that has happened, right? That Most has of happened. us are taller than our ancestors. Mm -hmm. You can even look at that generally in your own grandparents. Maybe not you, but I certainly could in my grandparents. <laughs> okay. And they're much smaller. And a whole generation of people are shorter. Go into an old house, ceilings are taller <laughs> because people didn't need to, you know, worry about bumping their heads. Right. They probably right. we're a transitional species, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I'll leave it at that. Thanks for coming today, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has been a great yeah. class. Thanks, Thanks for being here.